that opening music never gets old. I love it. <laughs> um, happy New Year, .NET friends. Believe it or not, this is the first episode of 2024. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, you are tuned in to the On.NET Live show. Our mission here on this show is to empower you, the .NET community, to achieve more. I'm your host, Scott Addy, and I'm joined by co-hosts David Pine and Hello. Matt Soko. Uh, Matt may be a new face to all of you uh, seasoned uh, viewers. We'd like to welcome Matt on board, um, adding him to the hosting rotation. Yeah, thank community. you. Love to be here. I couldn't believe when David and Scott sent me the email and asked, hey, you want to <laughs> you wanna be part of this? And I was like, yes, absolutely. How do I get started? So you and thought then, the request came from a greater Scott. That was. Yes. Cat. Yeah. 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 And a greater David. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I, I, I read the last name, so I know who it is. <laughs> Anyways, we are, That's right. We are um, <laughs> super stoked to have today's guest on the show, Martin Costello. Uh, everyone give him a virtual round of applause. Martin, I'd like to toss it over to you to briefly introduce yourself to the, all of our viewers. So, hey everyone, I'm Martin Costello. I'm a principal engineer at JustEatTakeaway.com. I'm also a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies, and I do a whole bunch of stuff on GitHub and open source and stuff as well. It would be really boring to go into all of it. I help work in Poly, because I've also worked with David on Poly. So, True. all right, GitHub. You mentioned GitHub. Um, the topic for today revolves around GitHub Actions uh, regarding how you would use that to automate monthly patching of your apps. Um, why don't we just dive right into the topic? I know you had some uh, content to share with the viewers, Martin. Let's pop that up on the screen and start um, right at the very beginning here. Sure. So obviously, uh, the CI CD systems are available other to GitHub, but I'm a big user of GitHub. I'm a big fan of GitHub. I moved a lot of my CI and CD systems to GitHub, um, well, quite a while ago now. But um, and you've got features like Dependabot. They keep your NuGet packages up to date and do things like that. But Dependabot doesn't keep the .NET runtime up to date for you. And something that most people who use .NET might not be aware of is According to the official support policy, every time there's a new patch release, you need to update your app to use that version of .NET to stay in support if you're using .NET slash .NET Core, .NET Frameworks, different. And historically, you haven't been able to use Windows Update to update the version of .NET that you have. And also, that only works on Windows. .NET Core works on Mac OS, Linux. TVs, iPhones, you name it. They don't have Windows Update for some strange reason. So you're sort of left with like the manual task of keeping things up to date if you have the time to invest to keep things up to date because we know developers are busy people, they've got things to do. So I'm also one of those weird people who likes keeping everything up to date all the time. But I didn't want to spend all the manual time actually updating more and more repos. I think at this point, I've got something like 50 repos under my GitHub account that have .NET in them somewhere. And I like to keep them up to date. And I'd rather not have to spend every patch Tuesday doing mind-numbingly boring version number bumps to keep everything up to date, because that's not really fun, even if it is weirdly therapeutic sometimes. <laughs> so so um, off the back of that, what I did a while ago now is I leverage the functionality of GitHub Actions because um, because there's a distinction. You've got GitHub Actions, which is like the product that runs things with like your CI or your CD system. But then there's also the slightly confusing terminology of a GitHub Action with the singular, which is a piece of code that you can use in a GitHub Actions workflow. And that supports um, Docker, shell scripts, JavaScript, and I think there's another one I've forgotten off the top of my head. Com what it composites. Is. The composites. Composite. That's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. She's like actions of actions. Right. Actions all the way down. <laughs> um, so what I did was I built a GitHub custom action myself that sort of does that work for you of updating your .NET SDK version. Doesn't do .NET upgrades for you. So if you're still running six or seven, 
it's not going to do an update to .NET 8, the latest and greatest for you. That's left as an exercise to the reader because that's a whole much more complicated proper proposition to try to do in an automated way. And then I've stitched that together with another um, open source tool, which is called .NET 8 Dated, which people might be familiar with, which can update NuGet packages for you. So by using GitHub Actions, a GitHub Action, and .NET outdated with some other stuff we can maybe talk about in a minute, we can stitch together some automation so that once a month, you can run a GitHub Actions workflow and that'll update your .NET uh, version for you in your repositories if you use GitHub. Yeah, so we did have our first qualifying question from uh, uh, Tick Top, Tick Tick Boom on Twitch asking, uh, are we talking about .NET version migrations done in CI on GitHub or am I lost? So that's exactly what we're talking about, right? Yes, tick, tick, boom, you are not lost. That is exactly what this does. Perfect. Yeah, I this is, this is actually really cool because I've done some stuff, um, some GitHub actions that try to solve similar problems. And I know that depend upon, you mentioned the, um, depend about earlier, depend about does new get dependencies. Um, so how does that differentiate from the core or some of the probably peripheral core concepts behind this? Cause is it like TFMs we're talking about or what exactly? So, so when I originally created this action, mm -hmm. uh, depend about didn't have the feature it has today, which is called group dependency updates. Okay. So today you can configure Dependabot to say like update all the packages at the same time or update all the .NET packages at the same time. But when this idea originally came about, everything was an atomic individual pull request. And if you're using say ASP.NET Core, every patch Tuesday when there's a new release of .NET, you might need to update 10 different NuGet packages. And you don't really want this drip feed of 10 different pull requests that will either conflict with each other and your CI won't work because they all need to be the same, or you having 10 different releases stacked up in your pipeline where the last one is like the magic one that actually completes the upgrade for you. Right. So right, okay. by using .NET outdated, I can sort of scope it down to just update the packages that are probably going to be part of a given Patch Tuesday release, and then they can all be updated at the same time. And then I can couple that with the SDK update so that I can get a single atomic pull request that updates all my dependencies. And then because I've got um, continuous integration set up on all my repos, I get a pull request, all the tests run. And then if it's all green, I'm confident that if my test run passes, the update is good. So it'll mm -hmm. be merged and then that'll go off and get deployed. Automatically, right? Yes, so yep. the bit that the action in of itself won't do, but we can talk about it in a bit mm -hmm. if we've got the time, is I've also written some automation that will then react to the pull request being opened, check what's being done, and if it's a .NET SDK update of just the packages I'm expecting to be updated, right. then I can get a GitHub bot to approve the pull request yep. and turn on auto merge. So then it all gets done for me. So tomorrow's Patch Tuesday, I expect that it will just all happen and I don't have to get involved. I right. should only get involved if something breaks. That's awesome. And I, I this is so cool because I've done something similar with Dependabot. I actually automated the Dependabot to, one, be self-managing so it actually update the, uh, the configuration. And then it would automatically approve and like review uh, all Dependabot PRs. Um, and if they were green, it would automatically merge them. So it's just like, I don't have to touch it if it works, but I admittedly didn't realize, um, that Dependabot had like the grouping function that you mentioned before. So I need to look back at that or maybe just jump ship and start using your stuff because it seems like you've already figured it all out. <laughs> so, so for, for my stuff, I've scoped it very tightly to just handling .NET updates. Yeah. Like, well, the, yeah the updates perfect, to yeah. other things I, I. I've also automated that, but that's outside the scope of this. Yeah, cool. That's really cool. Because um, part of the, I wouldn't say advantage, but with the approach I've taken here is you can kind of scale it up or turn it down. So if you're working in an environment where you have compliance things and maybe people aren't so happy with 
bots approving pull requests without humans looking at them and things like that, you can sort of tailor the integration at the, at the higher level that does the packages and the SDK so that um, you could still have a human involved. But ultimately, it's still driven by the way you protect your branches in GitHub. Mm -hmm. It's sort of not opinionated on if you have a, a, a CI or how many things need to pass in the CI or what your code coverage is. It's like, as long as the GitHub API says it can be merged, it will merge it. So if you need five reviewers, the GitHub API won't let it be merged until the reviewers come in and actually check it. But that still means that even if you're working in that sort of environment, um, you're reducing the human work to did the robot update the right things and is it green rather than right. also having to do all the file changes and look up what is this month's version. Right, right. That's awesome. So how how long have you worked on this this uh, specific GitHub action? Oh, there's a good question. I don't know. I can't remember how old it is. Let's see. Uh, when did the license file get? Four years. <laughs> <laughs> Four years ago, I wow. created the license file. That's awesome. But um, it, it's not always had the new get part into it. I think that's maybe about two years. Okay. But it was sort of like, as I accrued more and more repositories I wanted to maintain, I couldn't scale myself fast enough to keep <laughs> on top of the updates, to keep myself happy with having it all be up to date all the time. Oh, this is cool too. So I'm seeing a TS config and package JSON and uh, dot uh, NPM RC. So this is the JavaScript flavor of the authoring. Like you yeah. wrote, you wrote this in TypeScript. Yes. So in theory, if you're doing quote unquote standard GitHub actions, you, you don't need any extra tooling. Yep. Because all the the stuff to make it work for JavaScript comes with GitHub actions itself. So there's no extra tool dependencies required. So it's sort of native uh, yeah. actions. Yes. Yep. Cool. That's awesome. So oh, I've got so many questions. <laughs> Do you like TypeScript? That's like a really generic, non-related <laughs> question whatsoever. Like, I know you as a .NET developer. That's why it's like... So the things... I, I do like TypeScript, but I wouldn't necessarily say I'm like a TypeScript guru. Like, okay. I it, it caught my imagination initially because, one, it's type safe. Mm -hmm. Because how many times have people had a bug they've had to fix in production because they made a very silly typo? Too many. Test didn't catch it. And right. it was like, oh, that's supposed to be uppercase. <laughs> and then yeah. you fix it and then it all works. But it's like yeah. it catches those silly problems as near as possible to you writing the code originally on the keyboard. Right. And also, I I think I write TypeScript a bit more JavaScripty now. But when I first started using TypeScript, you just squint a bit. It's it's C sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Awesome. Um, yeah, that's really cool. So uh, what, I guess this is just like a, another generic thought I'm throwing out there because I'm not familiar with them. I've selfishly written several um, GitHub actions myself. Um, one thing that the feature I believe is lacking is there's no way to like see, uh, to my knowledge, who's using it. So there's like no ah. telemetry on who's using your GitHub actions. So there's a little bit of a way you can find that out. Um, if you go into your repository, go to insights. Okay. And you go to dependency graph. And you go to dependence. Oh, yes. I did remember seeing this at one point. But it's still kind of hard to get to, and it's not really. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if this is a true reflection. But, but if it is, in some ways, it's almost a bit sad because most of the users are me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Cool. Oh, this is great. Um, so uh, w when uh, would you propose that people look into this or start adopting this as, as something? I mean, obviously, A, if you're using GitHub, um, maybe two, if you're slightly familiar with GitHub Actions, I'm assuming it's pretty easy to use. It doesn't look like it's super, super difficult. Yeah. So um, one thing I'll clarify is like it's implemented with GitHub Actions, but it's mm -hmm. only to do the update. So if you use GitHub for source control, but you use Azure DevOps, your CI CD system, you don't have to remove that. You would just use GitHub Actions to create the pull request, and then that would hand over the CI CD system to your other system. 
So it's not like you need to be all in on the, um, the GitHub ah, Actions Kool-Aid to yep. use the system. You only need to use it to create the pull requests. And then everything else can be whatever tooling it is you're happy to use. But um, yeah, as you as you mentioned, it's like there's different levels of how complicated you can use it. So like the simplest one is you just add a little bit of YAML into a workflow mm -hmm. and then that'll update the SDK version in your global.json file. So that's the one requirement of using this is it requires you to have a global.json file in your uh, repo, okay. which is some sometimes it's controversial. I'm a big proponent of it because it makes your build reproducible because the GitHub Actions runner <coughs> will get updated month to month with the latest versions of the .NET SDK. And if you've got a project you don't touch for maybe three months and then you run it in three months and suddenly the build's broken, it's like, but I haven't changed anything. It's like, no, but the SDK version changed under the hood and it added a new feature that meant a warning is now an error or something and now your yeah. build's broken and you need to fix it. Right. Whereas okay. if you're pinning your SDK version with global.json, you, you know when things get upgraded and then you can easily correlate, oh, this upgrade breaks this. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that's interesting. So the other specifier is then that they need to have a global JSON. Yeah. Okay. Although part of the reason for that is also, well, if you didn't have one, there would be nothing to update. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yep. But that's like the minimum sort of amount you need. So this is like an entire working workflow file here. So it just has a name, a schedule. So runs every Tuesday. So that correlates roughly with patch Tuesday because if someone knows how to in cron do the second tuesday of every month i would love to know what the cron expression to do that is and i can put it in but until someone can come up with that it just runs every tuesday so <laughs> three, three weeks out of four nothing happens and then yeah. on the fourth week it will find the uh, the updates mm -hmm. and then just enough to actually do the update oh that's, uh, that's good martin you, i have a question on the global json um bit that you were talking about earlier so I know there are various key value pairs you can add in the global JSON file. Uh, allow pre-release is one. Uh, roll forward is another. Are there any key value pairs in that global JSON file you could add that maybe aren't considered by this tool? Or are there any known edge cases that don't work? Um, there shouldn't be. Like, cause, because this effectively only operates on the version property. It doesn't look at the rest of the file. Got it. So it should just update that one. And then anything else you've told it to do, as long as they don't conflict with whatever it's updated it to, then it should be fine. Okay. So you truly are, as a user of this, required to pin to a specific version of the SDK via the, the version attribute. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, um, I, it's not attempting to update you across major versions of .NET. So it just keeps you in the patch band that you're already in. Got it. So if you don't have a global.json, then you don't really need the action because you're just getting whatever's installed on the computer. And this isn't updating a computer, it's updating your repo. Yep, makes sense. Um, I wanted to dig into something else um, that you were talking about earlier. Uh, you were talking about the scenario where a customer isn't necessarily all in on GitHub. Maybe they're using something else like Azure Pipelines. Um, I saw our friend Tick Tick Boom mention this earlier. So for a customer like this, let's say they're using GitHub only for their personal open source work, but then at work in a startup or enterprise environment that they're using Azure Pipelines. Could you talk more about what someone like that might do if they're using a system like Azure Pipelines? So let's say in the, in the scenario where you're all in on Azure DevOps and you don't use GitHub at all, then what you could do is part of the beauty of open source. You can look at my repo and steal all the code and get it to do the same thing. You'd have to like do a bit of work yourself. Like I don't use Azure DevOps personally, so I don't really have the, the use cases and the availability of the tooling to try and make a custom as though version of this. But um, what the kind of, I can sort of slide into the, how you would do that. Cause not only could you just like, you know, oh, I'll take the code and copy it and make it work. But the core of what makes the action work in the first place is the release notes JSON for .NET itself. So this is something people might not be aware of 
is in the .NET Core repository in GitHub, there's a folder called Release Notes. And inside that is a bunch of JSON files. And every month when there's a new release of .NET, those files get updated with what the latest release is and what version of the SDK it comes with and what version of the runtime it comes with. So what my action is actually doing is it's just checking these files and seeing if the latest version in the index is greater than the version that's in your global.json file. And if the two don't match and your one is older, that's when it all kicks in and starts creating the pull request. So if you're using uh, as your DevOps, as an example, you could copy a, bun a bunch of the implementation and query the same JSON files out of the, GitHub, the public GitHub repository for .NET Core and use that as the driver to find what the re releases are. Interesting. So I, I was going to share with you, um, Martin, are you familiar with the Microsoft deployment.net releases NuGet package? I am not. I have not heard of that. So I'm actually using that one in my version sweeper GitHub action. Um, and it, I think it still might be in beta or something. It's been worked on for a while, or maybe it's released now. I have to double check. Um, but it actually does, um, it exposes all the serialization uh, and hooks for accessing these JSON files, these releases files in a, you know, strongly typed .NET manner. So that, that might be something that would be advantageous for you instead of doing it yourself. I'll, I'll have to send you that for afterwards. Yeah, I'll have a look into that. I don't, I think I can think of maybe some places where I would use it, but it wouldn't work for this because it's all in JavaScript, TypeScript. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Oh, yes. But it's good to but it's good to know there is that <laughs> there is a another approach to the same problem out there. Yeah, that can be used when you want to do it with .NET. Yes, because I I'm doing I'm trying to advocate for .NET GitHub Actions, um, which isn't always something that's I guess, it, it, like you said before, it doesn't seem native, right? With with the TypeScript and JavaScript approach, because but we've got native IoT now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy, I'm going to share some other stuff then. Uh, I'm going to bombard <laughs> you with messages and you're going to be like, oh my God, shut up. <laughs> it's going to be great. Um, but, cool. But yeah, so like, so if you look at the JSON file here, so this is the releases.json for .NET 7. So it tells us that the latest runtime release is 704 and the latest SDK of 70404. So this is sort of, for my GitHub action, this is the source of truth on if there's something to update to. And it also has handy things like um, they put links to CVEs. So if there's any CVEs in the release notes for release, that means it fixes a security uh, release, which reminds me actually, I haven't actually shown what this produces. So here's an example pull request that um, comes out of the, like the, the stitch together action of .NET dated in my action. So it creates a pull request and it tells you what version it's updating to, what runtime version that includes, and then if there's any security fixes as part of that release, that might mean that you might want to, if you're manually reviewing this, you might want to accelerate reviewing it and deploying it, then it also gives you a link to all the CVEs. So you can look into it and see what are those things that are being patched? Because one thing this doesn't do is it doesn't attempt to try and do these CVEs apply to you? because that's a harder, difficult problem. Because like, it might be that these are CVEs in, say, uh, WPF, but this is a web application, doesn't use WPF. So it's not actually relevant in those cases, but it's easy to just bring up, there were security fixes in this release to the surface in the pull request and let the human decide what to do about that rather than try and second guess what's relevant to you or not, because that's a whole different, like this whole business is built around that. <laughs> Right. And I like that, you know, keep it simple and don't try to over engineer and because then you get down these rabbit holes and it just becomes unmanageable. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And it's like, and this, this all builds up in pieces. So like there's the, there's the pure action, which just updates the SDK. And then you can stitch up together with .NET 8 dated to do the new get package updates as well. So in the, let me get the right tab. So inside, actually, it's in the readme. Here we go. So what I've also done is there's 
the concept in um, GitHub Actions of a shared workflow. So you can use a workflow from a workflow like, like you would call a function in a, in a programming language. So in the same repository as the action, there's also a reusable workflow where I've done the work to stitch my action and .NET outdated together for you so that then uh, you can just have a, a relatively short um, GitHub action that calls another GitHub action. And then that will do all the plumbing together of the different parts for you. So it's not like I was saying, here's a bit to do one bit. And if you use this other tool and plumb them together yourself, you can do another bit. It's like, I don't know, I've done that. I'm using that too. But it's sort of how it's almost like Lego pieces. You can build it up and make it more and more advanced. I love that. Um, it's almost like you could have two separate then GitHub actions that you publish. One is your base and then one is the composite because that's really what that is. It's a composite where it relies on the two different actions and composes them together. Yes. Yeah. Similar concept. I can't remember why I didn't do it as a composite action and it's a shared workflow. I'll probably remember after the stream, <laughs> but awesome. yeah, it's not, it's, it's, it's structured that way. And then, um, that gets pinned together. So like month to month, you effectively get this experience. That's Whereas awesome. every month you get a pull request updates, this one updates, this one updates, this one. So are you using this in like all of your .NET? repositories yeah. okay. so i use this in all of my public uh, github repositories well and like one or two private ones that other people can't see um but the actions also supported in github enterprise which is what we use at work so we also have a copy of this on our github enterprise and we also use that internally to keep things up to date as well and then I, I think it might be interesting to look at this from the consumer standpoint so if i come at this with kids gloves on and say, I, I, I'm all in on this idea. I'd like to adopt this in my GitHub project. What would that look like from that uh, consumer standpoint? Yeah, so just to set the scene. So there's an, there's an um, I also have a sample repository. So I have a, a repository where I've intentionally not hooked it into all of my automation and it's just self-contained. And I sort of Everything I've been talking about for like the last 20 minutes is all like in here in a readme file and like commented and what have you. So people can look at this repository, but to like sort of cut to the chase, inside that repository, here's the, the workflow file that does the updates. So I'll gloss over the comments, but it's just got a it's just got a cron schedule that runs every Tuesday. So that's in UTC. So that's usually after the point patch Tuesday is happened as like the discrete point in time event. So it should pick up the changes within a couple of hours. Uh, then there's some bits we can gloss over about making sure permissions work correctly and things like that. And then it just runs a workflow with some parameters to, to say, hey, update.net, uh, put these labels on the pull request if you open a pull request, run as this GitHub user and Quote, quote, unquote, that's it. <laughs> so when it says with labels, those labels have to exist within the repo or are they automatically created? So the way the GitHub API works is if you ask it to create a label, I think it will automatically create it. But if for some reason you say apply these labels and when it opens the PR, if the GitHub API fails or something, the code will just ignore it so the workflow won't fail. So you'll just okay. be missing the label rather than end up with something broken. Okay. And it also, um, it supports access tokens as well as apps. So, cause, um, sometimes apps have restrictions on things they can or can't do. Um, like, uh, I forgot on what, what they can't do. There's a use case where apps can't do a certain thing. So you might want to use a, like a bot user or something like that. So it supports, supports both, both modes. Whereas, um, in most cases, apps, in my opinion, are better because then it's like a service account and it's not pretending to be a person and it's a bit more secure because you can like scope down the permissions to exactly what it is you need. And then as an example in this workflow here, because this is a reusable workflow, you can also have outputs. So I've got like a second job here that uses the GitHub CLI 
So if, whoops, didn't mean to open that. So if there was an, a .NET SDK update and it included a security patch, then I can add a security label onto the pull request. So if, nice. if I had some query filters or other things that, that ran based on tags, they would all start happening. What happens if we miss? So here's what I'm thinking. I deal with some customers that really, really don't want to do automatic updates. And I know this is just putting a PR and so you're not actually doing quite the update already, but sometimes they want complete control where they, let's say we're going to create another branch and they're going to want to, you know, do an issue on it to kick it off or whatever can kick off an action or a workflow. What happens if we miss, we go from 8.01 to 8.01. One, you know, so we miss a bunch of patch Tuesdays. Is that cool? Does that work? Or are we? Yeah. So, so if you only run this every three months, mm -hmm. it, it will leapfrog you from whatever you had to whatever's now the latest. So you don't have to like do a stepped update. Like mm -hmm. you might be in an environment where you would not want that. And then you would end up having to manually do it because you want to incrementally go A, right. B, C, D. But the way the action works, it will just always leapfrog you to the latest release for that major version. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So when it leapfrogs, does it aggregate all of like the security patches and all the notes from the, the, the things that leaped over? Or does it just get the latest? So for the CVE links, they'll yeah. be aggregated up. So you okay. get the hot. I, I, I didn't think to find a link to this, but there's an, I've got an example somewhere where it's okay. like this long. Because it's a huge <laughs> leap. But um, I intentionally don't try and put the release notes themselves sure, into right, right. the PR because then you're getting into the realms of trying to parse HTML out of Markdown and not even the link though to the release notes. So it will link. It will link to the. There's a link in the JSON file to the release. It will link to that. Okay. But but it won't agree, it won't give you the link to like all the steps along the way. Got it. Sounds like a feature request to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Matt's Matt's question got me thinking. So is it possible today in current state to say I'm only interested in updating if there were CVEs included in that release? Maybe like an is CVE included property that you set to true? And if set to true, then it does the upgrade. Otherwise, it does nothing. So it isn't today because that had never occurred to me. <laughs> so it's not a thing it does, but it sounds like something that would be quite easy to add in to do only if any there's a there's a CVE in the sequence between A and between base and target. Yes, as as uh, as someone who talks to customers that behave in that way I, I think it could be useful i'm not advocating for that but I, I do know there are customers out in the wild that will only move if there's a cve associated with the release Interesting. it feels it feels like i've inadvertently got myself a free customer research se session <laughs> <laughs> i was thinking martin he's like oh we i did the wrong thing by coming on the show <laughs> now i have <laughs> No, this is this is awesome. I, I definitely see a, a use for this in my personal work. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I'm just trying to think of how I might want to use this or how a customer might want to use this, uh, which brings me to my next topic. So, let so you you said this feature does not exist. If I'm someone in the audience and it, and I'm thinking to myself, that sounds really interesting. I would like to open a PR or create an issue for that idea. How might someone like that proceed with, with doing that and getting involved? So I'd, li I'd like to think that I wrote a good contributing guide <laughs> in the repository for the action. But uh, yeah, so if you come to the uh, repository for the actions, that's Martin Costello update dash dot net dash SDK. Hopefully there's enough documentation to get you started for trying to contribute um, if there isn't. That in itself is an issue because I'd like it to be that if someone has a great idea and they think it should be implemented and it's sort of something that makes sense as a feature, then I'd love to accept um, pull requests from people to iterate on this and add new things because I think mostly this just gets feature updates when I think of something or I hit hit a problem that I want to be solved and not necessarily from non-me. <laughs> 
but um it sounds like today we've already had like two ideas that sound sensible to me so if if there's if um was it tick tick boom and whoever the or you scott if you <laughs> if you go i'd really love that and i'd like to contribute it then i welcome a pull request as long as long as you're happy coding in typescript <laughs> That's where you lost me. <laughs> if I'm being honest, you're going to ask me. Not, Nick, I would be all in. You would have a PR <laughs> by the end of the day. <laughs> but like, like to be to be honest, I think the t the two things that have been mentioned, I'll remember what they are by watching the screen back later. But like, they're probably things I I could probably easily myself add in and have like a new feature at the end of the week. But I'm happy to like not go turbo Martin mode and add new stuff. If there's people out there who'd like to make a contribution to open source, I would like to do it themselves. I don't want to just like kibosh that and go, oh no, well, you could have done a PR, but I already beat you to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you prefer like issues first to discuss it? I, I noticed that this repo doesn't have discussions enabled. Um, so, or do you so just you, like prefer PRs? Uh, I guess if it's like, off the top of my head, if it, if it was like a like a here's a whole new concept of something we might want to do, then an issue first would be great yeah. to discuss it and like maybe point in a certain direction of how we should do it. Or if the for whatever reason there was maybe a reason that I didn't want to support that because it had a maintenance burden to it that I didn't want yeah. to look after or something like that. But like if it's something like oh this bit of the readme was confusing, I'm going to just read work the dram the grammar or fix a link or something like that then don't worry about an issue just open a pull request <laughs> okay just fi just fix that doc <laughs> <laughs> awesome so one thing i'm really interested in for again folks who are interested in contributing uh what does your local workflow look like what so you, you you're working on a new feature you want to test this before shipping it um you want to talk a little bit about how you do that sure so I have the GitHub repository cloned locally. And um, in the source folder is all the TypeScript code. I mean, it's four files. It's not massively complicated, but I will go into the, most of the time, the .NET SDK updater TypeScript file and hunt around for, because of course, writing this, I know where, mostly where all the code is. So I can just go straight to the right bit which other people don't have that luxury because they don't live in my head. But um, most of the logic is in this one file. And then you would go to that, make, may have a look at what it is you might need to change. You'd possibly need to consult the .NET Core repository and look at like the JSON schema. Because if you wanted to consume a new property, it wouldn't be in my type definitions. You'd have to go find it, see how it works, add that in. And then once that's done, in theory, you should just need to run the build.ps1 file I have in the root of my repo, which uses PowerShell Core. So it should work on Mac OS and Linux. Sometimes it's a controversial opinion with colleagues of mine, but I'm a big fan of PowerShell Core because it works on all the platforms rather than me having to have a batch file and a shell script. I don't want to maintain two things. Exactly. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> so I'll just use the one. And if you don't like PowerShell, you don't like PowerShell. Just install it and run the script. No, I'm with you on that decision. It it just, as you pointed out, it feels odd to have to maintain two different things that have the same responsibility. Yeah. So um, seeing that there's a, a source directory and a tests directory, I'm assuming you would appreciate tests that validate any new implementation or changes to existing functionality. Definitely, yes. Uh, like in a previous life before I was a professional software developer, I was a professional software tester. So um, ah, okay. All, it's almost burned into my brain whenever I see a PR. It's like, have you added any tests? Right, right. Uh, and then also there's a, a dist directory, and that's where the uh, the, the final JavaScript bits are are you know yeah published. So, so so yeah. So if if someone wants to contribute a feature, as long as they run the build.ps1 before they do their git commit, the the packaging setup in the package.json file will automatically run the tasks that are needed to regenerate the dist file. And then that just needs to go with the commit. And I think yep. even I myself have forgotten to do that. So I've automated something in my repo that tells me off with a comment if I forget to do it. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, I, I've, I've done a similar thing because I've done the, the exact same thing where I've forgotten to update it and I'll cut a new release. And I'm like, why is this still not working? I know I just fixed this. And it's like, oh yeah, you didn't 
So I've automated it to where if I forget, it creates a pull request that runs it for me. Uh, I like that. I might I might think that later <laughs> and steal it. It's another link I'll send you. Great minds think alike. <laughs> but yeah, it's like ultimately I'm just trying to reduce the human toil to do all those things that we know we should be doing that we might not do because we only have so much time. Where it's like you can you can do the fun things and keep the security team happy at the same time. <laughs> yep, I'm all for that. Um, are there any other things we wanted to touch on in today's show or um, have we covered pretty much all of it? Uh, the only other, th well, actually two more things I was just gonna quickly show is I've mentioned a couple of times it's a bit like Lego bricks. So I've got another pool, uh, repository of my own. This is more for people to look at and get an idea, not like a thing people can use because it's basically just an open PR for my usage. But um, I have a GitHub repository where I have some other custom actions. And because I use a GitHub app as to like as the account that does all these pull requests, rather than having the same GitHub actions workflow in 50 repositories, I've centralized it all in one repository and I use the GitHub API to find the repositories that need checking, and then I run it all as a big matrix. So here I have an update.NET SDK's workflow, and then that goes off and runs my um, custom action that uses the permissions of my GitHub app to find all the repos it can see, finds all the ones that have global.json in, and then they're the ones that are the targets of the updates. And then I have a GitHub matrix job that then runs that work the my shared workflow in the scope of all of those repositories in parallel. So when Patch Tuesday happens tomorrow, one workflow runs, which spawns a whole bunch of other workflows, and then I get spammed by um, GitHub bots, and everything updates and auto merges, and off it goes, and I don't have to do anything. Well, that's the plan anyway. Occasionally, there might be like a random bug happened and it gets flushed out, but then the PR doesn't pass, so it doesn't get merged, so it doesn't break anything. And then I can go off to a repository somewhere and go, hey, I just updated and now my stuff's broken. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I'm curious, what would an example, I, I always like um, showing the visual to our viewers of GitHub Actions that utilize the matrix functionality because it's really cool visual for how it like fans out. So do you have any previous uh, yes. action runs? Let me find one. Uh, update SDKs. Uh, I say this one. Nope. <laughs> Need to find one that actually did something. Uh, here we go. So here's one. Yeah, that's awesome. So get re so some other automation of mine actually went, this needs to run now rather than it running on a cron trigger. And then that kicked it off. And then that updated all of those repos. That's really cool. And also, because it runs the GitHub Actions, I also use the, um, the GitHub workflow summaries. So we should get like a copy of the markdown in the GitHub Actions. Okay. This is this is really well polished. So kudos for how well this has come together. This is awesome. Thank you. And then the last thing I was going to mention, which is re really in the advanced use case now, is I'm also one of those weird people that likes testing all the pre-releases. But um, that's a bit of effort too. So I have a blog post here. I've I can share the link afterwards. Um, this also works with pre-releases. And it's hooked into the .NET installer repository. So I can install dailies of the .NET vNext with this as well. And it will do all the updates for me on the same process. So if, you, if you're really a glutton for punishment and really like the bleeding edge, it can do all your, it can update your, um, your branches of your like .NET 9 stuff, which hasn't landed quite yet. We haven't got preview one yet. But once preview one's here, I can start investing in my pre-release testing using the same stuff as well. Well, we do have a question um, in the chat here that I'd like to pop up on the screen. There it is. Um, and the question comes from uh, our friend Benjo over on Facebook. Can you show the branch role permission? 
Oh, there's a good question. Right, let me see what I've put in the readme to remind myself on the permissions. <laughs> so by default, it will need contents right and yes, contents right for so right for contents and pull requests. That's the minimum permissions needed so it can clone your repository, push a commit and then create a pull request for it. So that's the minimum amount of permissions it needs. Yeah, that's always been an interesting kind of uh, feature too. I like I like how explicit it and like finite it can be, but I also wish that sometimes if it would fail that it would like GitHub would just be like, "Oh, you're missing this specific permission." It's oh, yes. Pretty whole itself, but <laughs> I, I know what you mean. You just get a GitHub API returned 403. Right, and you're like, what? What am I missing? What? And you have to go spend like the next forty five minutes trying to research who successfully did it somewhere. <laughs> yes, I, I, awesome. I have also experienced that pain. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Awesome. All right. Um, well, I think we're at a point where we've addressed all of the open questions, uh, and we could wrap things up unless there's anything I'm missing here. Anything? I don't think so. I didn't see anything else. Any, anything else that uh, you'd like to share, Martin? Uh, I don't think so. I think I, I think all the tabs I pre-prepared of something to show have come up at some point or I've talked about them. Awesome. Wonderful. All right. Well, we'll wrap things up then. I'd like to thank all of our viewers for tuning in to On.NET Live today. As a reminder, you can check out other .NET Live streams like the one you watched today over at dot.net slash live. If you find there's nothing to watch on your favorite streaming service, Netflix, or whatever it may be, there you go. I just uh, provided you hours of entertainment. I hope um, it's a good season finale. Yeah. <laughs> also, I hope there's uh, not a finale. Yeah. We <laughs> season finale. Not yeah, season, season, finale. season, right. <laughs> also, as a reminder, um, Next week, we will not have a show, an observation of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, you can tune in again and catch this crew on January 22nd. We'll be joined by a familiar face to the show, Steve Smith, and he will talk to us about taming a link, that's L-I-N-Q, proliferation with specifications. Uh, Steve has created a NuGet package called rdallas.specification. We'll hear all about what problem that solves and how to use it on January 22nd. Thanks again, folks. We'll see you next time. Bye. Awesome. Bye. Bye.